the Civil War battle series, the Battle of Franklin, John Bell Hood's catastrophic defeat. Imagine yourself in Franklin, Tennessee on a crisp November evening in 1864. The Civil War raged on, and this small town found itself at the center of a brewing storm. Union General John Schofield, outnumbered, awaited the inevitable Confederate assault, led by the fiery General John Bell Hood. The tension was thick, hanging heavy in the air like the smell of gunpowder. As night fell, Hood unleashed his attack. Wave after wave of Confederate soldiers, fueled by battle cries and flickering hope, surged towards the Union lines. Musket fire erupted in a deafening roar, painting the darkness with flashes of light. Exploding artillery shells rained down, turning the battlefield into a chaotic inferno. The Union defenses, though outnumbered, held firm. Their rifles spat death into the ranks of the attackers, mowing down wave after wave with relentless efficiency. Despite the withering fire, Hood knew victory lay only through the heart of the Union lines. Break. Exhausted and decimated, Hood finally called off the attack as dawn painted the battlefield red. Over 8,500 men lay dead or wounded, making it one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War in proportion to the forces involved. Claiborne's death was a devastating blow to the Confederacy, robbing them of a skilled leader and further dimming their already flickering hopes for victory. Today, the battlefield at Franklin remains a silent testament to the battle's ferocity. The preserved trenches and monuments stand as a stark reminder of the night's carnage. The Battle of Franklin marked a turning point, the Confederacy's last chance to seize the initiative in the West. Though they inflicted heavy casualties on the Union, their victory was short-lived. Just weeks later, they faced defeat at Nashville, cementing their fate in the war. The Battle of Franklin serves as a chilling reminder of the human cost of war, a story that continues to resonate through the ages. Walking the fields where valiant soldiers charged and fell, one can't help but feel the weight of history, a somber echo of sacrifice, and the enduring spirit of humanity in the face of unimaginable loss. Determined to strike Union forces before they reached Nashville, General John Bell Hood threw his entire army at the entrenched enemy at Franklin. On the morning of November 30, 1864, Fountain Branch Carter, a 67-year-old farmer, planner, and Confederate sympathizer, watched as his front yard in Franklin, Tennessee, filled up with Union soldiers pitching tents and starting campfires. Carter had come into contact with the blue-clad troops before, but never an entire army. The Columbia Pike, a macadamized road that ran past Carter's red brick farmhouse near the southern edge of town, was also crowded with Union soldiers, wagons, horses, and artillery pieces. More were strung out along the pike as far as Carter could see in the direction of Spring Hill, Lee's 4th Corps, charged by Schofield with repairing a defense of Franklin and the two vital bridges over the Harpeth River. Brigadier General Jacob Cox and his staff had roused the Carter family before dawn, taken possession of the house, and turned the parlor into the field headquarters. By noon, well over 20,000 Federals had either marched past on the pike or taken up positions in a crescent-shaped line and breastworks running east to west, 100 yards south of Carter's front door. The Carter home, situated just 50 feet from the pike on the west side of the road, occupied a prominent hill that Cox quickly recognized would be the key to his defensive line. Federal forces had controlled this region of Tennessee for the past two years and had constructed earthen artillery emplacements on the northern bank of the Harpeth, which they dubbed Fort Granger, where Schofield may now made his headquarters. 
while Cox and Stanley conferred with engineers about how to best get 800 wagons and 23,000 troops across the river and onto the road to Nashville by the evening, Carter had the security of his large family to worry about. Moscow Carter, his oldest living son and paroled Confederate officer, lived with him. Two other sons were serving in the 20th Tennessee Regiment, part of the Gray Host, marching north from Spring Hill that morning, along with four daughters, a widowed daughter-in-law, and nine grandchildren under the age of 12. After Cox informed him that any fighting that day would take place either west or east of the town, should the Confederates attempt a flanking movement as they had the previous day, Carter decided to remain in his home. It would be a pike 70 yards behind the main line. The new position was located just behind two outbuildings near the Carter home, and six artillery pieces were moved into position in Carter's backyard. After hiding most of his food stores, Carter escorted more than a dozen family members, a group of neighbors, and three of his long-freed slaves down to his large basement where they remained when the Battle of Franklin abrupted above them at about 4 p.m. The, the roughly two acres taken up by the Carter home and the cotton gin would quickly become the epicenter of one of the most savage, costly, and decisive battles of the Civil War. Angry and frustrated after his Army of Tennessee failed to trap Schofield's retreating army the previous day at Spring Hill, Lieutenant General John Bell Hood had decided to gamble everything in a last-ditch attempt to overtake Schofield's two corps at Franklin and drive them into the river. Upon his arrival at Winstead Hill, two miles south of Franklin, at the head of six of his army's nine divisions, Hood dismissed the concerns of his stunned subordinates and ordered a frontal assault to be launched within the hour. Success could alter the military balance in the western theater of the war and prolong Hood's desperate 11th hour campaign to retake Tennessee. By the fall of 1864, Major General William Tecumseh Sherman had decisively achieved one of his objectives, the capture of Atlanta, but not the other, the destruction of Hood's army. Elevated to command after his predecessor, General Joseph E. Johnston, retreated 90 miles from Dalton, literally to the outskirts of Atlanta, Hood did what President Jefferson Davis and his advisors wanted him to do, fight. Outnumbered almost two to one and facing the best commanders in the Union could offer, Hood had fought three battles in eight days to defend the city and defeat Sherman in detail. Despite three defeats, Hood managed to extend his lines far enough to prevent Sherman from cutting rail lines into Atlanta, thus swarting the Union general for five more weeks. Finally, to avoid encirclement, Hood abandoned the city on September 1st. Hoping to force Sherman to abandon Atlanta and fall back to protect his vulnerable single-track line of communications to Chattanooga, Hood led 38,000 Confederates along the railroad into northern Georgia during October, attacking targets of opportunity. Sherman first turned back to Dalton to deal with Hood, skirmishing over ground captured months earlier, and finally drove the Confederates into Alabama and repaired the railroad. Frustrated, both commanders then opted for radically different plans for their respective campaigns. Sherman cut his supply line, abandoning Atlanta, and set out for the Atlantic coast with 60,000 men, detaching Major General George Thomas to Nashville and ordering Schofield to delay Hood's expected advance into Middle Tennessee. After a costly three-week delay, Hood's army reached the Tennessee border on November 21st to a fulsome welcome from exiled Governor Isham Harris. Hood's bold but risky plan to destroy Schofield's army and retake Nashville was backed by Davis and his principal advisors, General Braxton Bragg and P.G.T. Beauregard. With surprising skill, Hood moved quickly and got around Schofield's army at Columbia. By late afternoon on November 29th, two Confederate corps had descended on Major General Patrick Claiborne and John Brown. 
with Colonel Emerson Updike's brigade of Brigadier General George Wagner's division providing the rear guard, most of Schofield's army made it to the vicinity of Franklin by noon and immediately began working on the defenses. Stanley ordered Wagner's other two brigades, those of Colonels John Lane and Joseph Conrad, about 3,000 men, to occupy an advanced position astride the Columbia Pike a half mile in front of the main Union works, where they were to delay any general enemy advance and then withdraw into Cox Line when pressured. Since Wagner's division had been in the thick of the fighting at Spring Hill, suffering almost all of the Union's 350 casualties, then had to conduct rear guard actions in the march north, Wagner and other 4th Corps officers represented what they felt was Schofield's preferential treatment of the 23rd Corps. Updike was angry as well. While Lane's and Conrad's brigades had marched at relative ease on the road to Franklin, Updike's Ohioans hadn't been relieved during their entire 10-mile march. Upon their arrival at Winstead Hill, they remained in line of battle, facing Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest's Confederate troopers, while Wagner's other two brigades deployed east of the pike on a separate knoll known as Breezy Hill. When the congestion on the pike cleared, Wagner began leading his division toward the safety of Franklin. Soon, though, a new order from Schofield arrived. Wagner was to hold Winstead Hill with a rear guard until dark, unless too severely pressed. Following orders, Wagner turned his column about and countermarched, but soon observed two huge Confederate infantry columns advancing northward, one on the Lewisburg Pike and one on the Columbia Pike. The latter column was already deploying into line of battle, their rifle barrels glistening in the sunlight. Without hesitation, Wagner ordered a withdrawal. Lane, Conrad, and Updick wasted little time complying with that command. As he retreated northward, Wagner unilaterally decided that his division would follow the spirit of Stanley's original orders, to hold back any rebel advance as long as possible. Halfway back across the two-mile valley, Wagner ordered Lane's brigade to halt and occupy the southern slope of a flat, open hill on the west side of the road known locally as Privet Knob. About a half mile from Cox's main line, Wagner halted his leading brigade, Conrad's, and ordered that commander to take position along a gentle rise of ground east of the pike in a cleared cotton field. Not expecting to fight, Conrad's men rested without entrenching. When Updike arrived, Wagner ordered him to deploy his brigade on the west side of the pike, adjacent to Conrad, to present a two-brigade front. The headstrong Updike ran out of patience. His men had been on arduous rearguard duty since before dawn, he complained, and hadn't eaten or had coffee all day. Not only that, the position he was told to occupy was untenable, being exposed and without natural cover. Ignoring Wagner's orders, Updike angrily rode on without bothering to halt. When Updike's troops reached the main works, Wagner told Updike to deploy where he saw fit and fight in reserve wherever he was needed. Finding the area to the rear of the Union line overcrowded, Updike continued north along the pike to the first available open space, located 200 yards beyond the Carter home, where at 2.30 p.m. his men stacked their arms. Wagner rode to the Carter house where he was ordered to serve under Cox, the overall commander of the main defensive line. Unaware that vast columns of gray infantry were now sweeping over the Winstead Hill, Cox merely told Wagner to act according to his earlier orders. Angry and exhausted, Wagner sent word to Lane to withdraw from Privet Knob and take up a position on Conrad's right in the cornfield. There, he and Conrad were to stay put, fight the enemy if he advanced, and retreat to the main works only if overpowered. Wagner then returned to the safety of the Carter House, where he began drinking heavily. Shaken by the unexpected orders to hold this open field line, Conrad hurriedly ordered his men to entrench. Hood, meanwhile, had been studying the enemy's position through field glasses. He believed he had detected a weak spot in the Union Center where the Columbia Pike bisected the defenses. 
Having brought the enemy to bay, Hood announced, We will make the fight. When Lieutenant General Alexander Stewart's corps began arriving around noon, Hood sent them and Forrest's men on a flanking march east toward the Lewisburg Pike. He had decided to use Cheatham's corps as his shock troops. At about 2.45 p.m., the gray column surged forward, 20,000 strong, young men from every southern state except North Carolina and Virginia deployed into lines of battle at the northern edges of Winstead and Breezy Hills in a two-mile-wide front. The attack would be made from three directions along the major roads. Stewart's Corps up the Lewisburg Pike against the Union left. Cheatham's Corps with Claiborne's and Brown's divisions astride the Columbia Pike against the Union Center near the Carter House, and Major General William Bates' division up Carter's Creek Pike along the Union right, backed by Brigadier General James Chalmers' Cavalry Division. Only two six-gun batteries were on hand to contest the Union guns. Hood had weighted the assault columns heavily against the Union left, sending four divisions of infantry and two cavalry to attack the enemy's eastern flank from the Harpeth River to the Columbia Pike. Across the Columbia Pike on the longer western flank from the Carter House to Carter's Creek Pike and a bit beyond, Hood deployed two infantry divisions and a single cavalry division. Hood's last words to his men were, Drive the enemy into the river at all hazards. Claiborne, still stung by Hood's accusations that he had failed to prevent the Union withdrawal the night before, saluted and responded tersely, General, I will take the works or fall in the attempt. When his aide, Brigadier General Daniel C. Govan, turned to leave, he said, well, General, few of us will ever return to Arkansas to tell the story of this battle. Well, Govan, said Claiborne, if we are to die, let us die like men, as he pulled his sword out of his scabbard. The Confederate tide was about 100 yards from Wagner's advanced line when the Union men unleashed a volley of musket fire that momentarily staggered the attackers. But due to the unchecked advance of Stewart's corps on the right, Conrad's line was soon outflanked and enveloped. Soon, all of Conrad's and Lane's men were in full retreat, the attackers pursuing the fleeing Confederates as a cry of, Go into the works with them, was heard along the line. The pursued and pursuers became so intermingled in a wedge-shaped mass of humanity, veering haphazardly toward the gap in the pike, that Union defenders in the main works had to hold their fire for fear of hitting their comrades. The ground in front of the Union parapets were soon covered with dead and wounded from both sides as Cheatham's attackers poured through the gap at the Columbia Pike on the heels of Wagner's men into and over the adjacent breastworks. Hearing shouts of rally in the rear among Wagner's retreating officers, many of the men in the front line brigades of Colonel Silas Strickland and Brigadier General James Riley joined the mad rush for the rear. East of the road, two Ohio regiments, the 100th and 104th, had been posted to support a Kentucky battery's four rifled guns. With the guns unable to fire into the ranks of Wagner's fugitives, the drivers fled, taking their limbers and caissons with them, and soon both Ohio units fled as well. A 200-yard front stretching from the Carter Cotton Gin to a locust grove west of the Pike had been captured and virtually cleared of Union troops. In addition to Lane and Conrad's 12 regiments, three of Cox's regiments plus parts of two others had been routed, and a wild mob of men and stampeding horses was racing to the rear past the Carter House. A Union officer later recalled, it looked as though our line had been crushed at the center, and nothing can save the little army away from destruction. From his vantage point, north of the Carter home, where his six regiments had taken up position, Updike watched as Wagner's routed men poured back over the works. When he tried to move several of his regiments to the east side of the pike, many of Updike's men misconstrued the movement as an order to advance, and rushed forward directly into the confused mob to their front. This initial rush for the works swept through Updike's remaining units like an electric current. 
The 125th Ohio seemed to hesitate, and Updike shouted, First Brigade, forward to the works! On horseback, Updike drew his revolver and plunged ahead into the fray. After first colliding with the mass of Union fugitives hurling northward, Updike's men crowded and bayoneted their way into the Carter Yard, pressing for the retrenchment line west of the pike. There they observed the main elements of Claiborne's and Brown's division pouring over the low breastworks like sheep in a wheat field, and a vicious hand-to-hand -hand melee erupted. As Updike's troops struggled to drive the enemy back across the retrenchment, the rattle of musketry swelled, great sheets of flame leaping from thousands of muzzles in a continuous roar. Many of Cox's and Wagner's men, having rallied and returned to the fray at the urging of their officers, joined Updike's brigade in and around the crowded Carter Yard. Soon the Federal ranks for four or five deep, those in the front rank firing and passing their empty muskets to the rear, where they were loaded and passed back up to the front. Unable to stand unprotected in the face of this firestorm, many Confederates ducked back behind the retrenchment, while others sprinted back seventy yards to the main Union breastworks. Still, others simply dropped their weapons and surrendered. Arriving on the scene, Stanley saw so many gray-clad prisoners moving to the rear that he thought for an instant that the enemy had broken through and routed Updike's brigade. Although Updike's countercharge had pushed back the Confederates, repeated assaults mounted by Cheatham's follow-on brigades, unimpeded by abatis or obstructions, kept the Carter House in the vortex of a firestorm. On the north side of the retrenched line, the men of Updike's, Conrad's, Lane's, and Strickland's brigades fought from behind the low rail barricade and garden fence, while across the Carter Garden to the south of the Confederates returned fire from the captured main works. The six Napoleon guns deployed earlier, now worked by Updike's men, added greatly to the carnage in the Carter Yard. Firing from behind the retrenched line, they poured shell and canister into the enemy-held parapet at a range of just 70 yards. By 5 p.m., when a short lull in the fighting took place, the Union lines had been re-established across the 19 acres taken up by the Carter property. As the ferocity of the Confederate attacks ebbed, a new factor in the fighting emerged. The southern location of the Carter Cotton Gin had become a salient in the main line. This meant that the Confederates occupying the ditch in Strickland's front, just west of the pike, were advanced beyond the line of the Cotton Gin, which Cotton's men still held, and were thus exposed to severe enfilading fire from that direction. As Confederate losses mounted, a stalemate was reached around the gap in the works and the Carter House. It seemed likely that the final result would be decided elsewhere. With Cox in overall command of the Union defenses, Riley had assumed command of Cox's division. His brigade and those of Colonels John Caseman and Israel Stiles defended the works in A.P. Stewart's front. Stiles was located on the far left near the river and railroad cut, Caseman in the center just east of the Cotton Gin, and Riley between the Gin and the Columbia Pike. They numbered about 5,000 against perhaps 10,000 of Stewart's 1,300 dismounted cavalry under Abraham Buford and 4,000 of Cheatham's troops. From the woods near the McGavick Mansion, close to the Lewisburg Pike, three brigades under Major General William Loring now emerged from the trees and attacked the Union left. They had about 1,000 yards to go when three-inch rifle guns at Fort Wagner opened up followed by the roar of Riley's 12-pounder Napoleons. Great gaps appeared in the attacking ranks, so many that not all could be closed up. From the railroad tracks to the Lewisburg Pike and almost to the cotton gin, a thick abatis lay in front of the assaulting columns, 50 feet from the main line of the works. The thorny, shrub-like trees had been chopped off at about four feet above the ground by Cox's men, opening a clear field of fire while preserving an almost impassable barrier below. Surplus hedge tops had been dragged to other sectors in the line. 
The attackers struggled mightily to work their way through the thorny palisades, all the while under galling cannon and musket fire. The storm of projectiles coming from front and flank blunted Loring's thrust in less than an hour. Following brigades were compelled to detour farther toward the center of the field, away from the snarling congestion at the hedges. The ground on the eastern part of the field became a virtual death zone, wrote a Union survivor, one that not even a rabbit could cross safely. Major General Edward Walthall's battle-hardened division now advanced on Loring's left, with Brigadier General William Clarrell's Tennessee Brigade advancing at a full run against Casemate's front, where they came to an abrupt halt at the hedge. Unable to pass through the palisades, they tried futilely to push or pull it aside, all the while making easy targets for Casemate's infantrymen. One company of the 65th Indiana was armed with 16-shot Henry repeating rifles, and soon a dreadful heap of killed and wounded lay in their front, looking like a rail fence that had been toppled over, the bodies laying in a straight line. The remnants of Walthall's division staggered west toward the Cotton Gin Salient, where Brigadier General Charles Shelley's troops were heavily engaged with Riley's brigade. The Union position there was formidable, and Ambushers for two 12-pound Napoleons of the 6th Ohio Light Battery, commanded by Lt. A.P. Baldwin, had been cut in the works near the Cotton Gin, supported by the 65th Indiana on Baldwin's left and the 104th Ohio on his right. When Shelley's men were just feet from the Union line, Baldwin's gunners opened up with double charges of canister into the massed ranks. Added to the musket fire from the parapet, the storm of missiles was so intense that the attackers seemed to be literally blown away like leaves in an autumn gust. Baldwin later recalled that he could hear two sounds above the roar of battle, the detonation of the charges and the crunching of bones in front of their muzzles. The slaughter around the Cotton Gin Salient raged on as four reserve brigades of Stuart's Corps, their ranks mostly intact, approached the flaming works. The attackers lost cohesion, however, with converging brigades crowding toward the center of the field before being driven back upon one another. The emergence of multiple gray battle lines resulted in repeated assaults, causing some Union officers to believe that they had endured as many as 13 separate attacks, seemingly by the same Confederate troops. Among Stewart's displaced brigades was that of Brigadier General Francis Cockrell, whose Missouri troops struck the hedge in Casement's front, then veered west, only to be swept away by the storm of Union fire. Cockrell's 687-man unit was virtually wiped out, suffering over 60% casualties. General John Adams' brigade was the next Confederate Union to mount an uncoordinated and isolated attack near the Cotton Gin. It, too, was abruptly halted 50 feet from Casement's position by the abatis of hedge tops. In an attempt to get his men moving forward again in the smoke and confusion, Adams spurred his mount toward the flaming parapet and urged it to jump the ditch and embankment. Moments later, after the horse crashed onto the parapet, dead, Adams was riddled with bullets and fell mortally wounded into a ditch at Casement's feet. With a cotton gin firmly in federal hands and ranks of blue uniformed soldiers firing obliquely westward, the attacking Confederates pressed against the parapet's outer ditch were slaughtered like sheep. George Gordon, soon to be wounded and captured, called it a massacre, while an Illinois soldier remembered, I never saw men put in such a hellish position. The wonder is any of them escaped death or capture. Brigadier General Thomas Ruger's division of the 23rd Corps constituted the main infantry force defending the Union right west of the Columbia Pike, where the cut branches and snarled treetops of a large locust grove south of the Carter House Hill provided a crude abatis. Chaos had engulfed Ruger's units earlier when Wagner's fleeing soldiers came crashing back through the gap in the works, forcing them back to the retrenched line. Strickland's men had formed on Updike's right and helped repulse the first attack of Brown's Confederates. Meanwhile, the 111th Ohio on Strickland's right fought doggedly and retained possession of the main works adjacent to the Locust Thicket. 
withstanding attacks by the brigades of Brigadier Generals State Rights Gist and John Carter. Although Gist's charge stalled when it struck the Locust Grove, the ongoing chaos near the Columbia Pike allowed the attackers to work their way forward through the Abatis and up to the main line, where they fought hand-to-hand with the remnants of the 72nd Illinois and the 111th Ohio. The 72nd Illinois gave way, but Gist's brigade did not have the strength to do more than just hold its position. When Carter's brigade came up in support, one of Gist's officers watched as Union muskets and cannon fire tore their line to pieces before it reached the Locus Abatis. Shattered, Carter's survivors sought shelter beyond the ditch held by Gist's men. It was about this time that Captain Todd Carter, an aide to Brigadier General Thomas Benton Smith, joined the fray. As an assistant quartermaster, Carter wasn't obliged to fight, but the sight of Union soldiers in his home and breastworks covering his father's yard were more than enough motivation. Mounted on horseback, Carter charged in the battle near the Locust Grove and shot nine times, fell mortally wounded 530 feet from the home he hadn't seen in three years. He was found the next morning and taken to his boyhood home, where he died on December 2nd. Brown soon learned that Carter's attack had been unsupported on the Confederate left, where Bates' division had appeared on the Carter's Creek Pike as expected. Before he could act to remedy the situation, Brown was seriously wounded, and after he was carried from the field, little was done to get the stalled attack going. Unable to reach their assigned positions before darkness approached, Bates' three brigades belatedly advanced towards the smoldering locust grove. Bates split his under-strength division, sending one brigade west of Carter's Creek Pike and himself leading two brigades toward the Locust Grove. Although Bates' attackers were few in number, they managed to send the raw recruits of the 183rd Ohio fleeing to the rear. Bates' troops poured over the rampart, and hand-to-hand fighting ensued, but the arrival of reinforcements added to oblique artillery fire, sending Bates' men sagging back across the parapet. Ordered to support Bates' advance, Chalmers had waited along the extreme western flank all day for his infantry arrival. Finally, at 5 p.m., Chalmers sent his 2,000 dismounted troopers forward, alone, against the right of Brigadier General Nathan Kimball's line. In the face of horrendous fire, they pressed ahead within 60 yards of the parapet before withdrawing to snipe at long range. On the Confederate right, Forrest's cavalry had been repulsed as well, north of the Harpeth. Hood had rashly split his cavalry command into segments, and the much-dreaded Wizard of the Saddle defeated, as much by the disbursement of his division as by Union cavalry, was relegated to a minor role in the day's fighting. It probably saved Forrest's life. Although by now the issue had long been decided, Hood wasn't ready to give up the fight. He ordered a night attack by his only available reserve, the 2,700 men of Major General Edward Johnson's division of Lee's Corps. Lee had arrived at 4 p.m. and on Hood's orders, hurriedly organized a futile advance that went forward without proper guides or any understanding of what sector his men were to assault. A bit after 9 p.m., four of Johnson's brigades advanced toward the center of the field by torchlight. On their left lay the shattered locust grove, on their right the smoldering parapets in front of the cotton gin. Three brigades got as far as the ditches of the outer works, where devastating blasts of musket and cannon fire, as well as insulating fire from both flanks, halted the assault. Johnson's troops suffered 587 casualties in less than an hour. As the night turned cold, most of the surviving Confederates abandoned the outer ditches and withdrew to the line occupied earlier by Wagner's men. By 11 p.m., all was quiet, save for the moans and cries for water from the wounded. From the cotton gin across to the Locust Grove, perhaps 5,000 dead and wounded Confederates lay strewn in grotesque bundles. The death toll upon Hood's field-grade officers had now reached unprecedented levels. 
Of the 24 generals exposed to battle, six were dead or mortally wounded. Patrick Claiborne, John Adams, Hiram Granbury, Alfield Strahl, John C. Carter, and States' Rights Gist. Four others were seriously wounded, and another was captured. The Army's middle command structure with 54 regimental commanders killed or wounded had been shattered as well. The death toll on the Confederate side came to 1,700, a butcher's bill that one writer said without exaggeration sent the entire state of Tennessee into mourning. Although some subordinates broached the idea of a counterattack for the next morning, Schofield, being surprised and shocked by Hood's unexpected movements twice in one day, was content to escape with his army to Nashville. Hood marched his wrecked army to Nashville as well, where he established fortified lines south of the city on December 2nd, appealing in vain to Confederate authorities for reinforcements and supplies and waiting for Thomas to attack. Hood hoped to defeat his old West Point instructor and pursue the defeated foe back into Nashville and reclaim it for the Confederacy. On December 15th and 16th, Thomas counterattacked and routed Hood's depleted forces using all his combat arms, infantry, artillery, cavalry, and repeating rifles to win one of the most decisive battles ever fought in North America. The Hard Luck Army of Tennessee, what remained of it, fought and straggled its way back across the Tennessee River, hounded by Union cavalry and infantry. Only 18,000 Confederates crossed the river on December 25th. Hood resigned in disgrace shortly thereafter. After burying his son Todd in Franklin, Carter and his family turned to the task of restoring their shattered home and farm and reviving their livelihood. The Confederate government refused to compensate Carter for the considerable damage to his property. The cotton gin and eight outhouses were dismantled for breastworks. The fields were heavily damaged, and the farm was never again as profitable as it once was. Carter sold off much of his 288 acres of cotton and cornfields not long after the war. He died in 1871, and his son Moscow sold the home and farm property in 1896. It seemed haunted, anyway, after the events of November 30th, 1864. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. And love it.